This audio lecture is going to look further at the question, what exactly is art? What do we mean by art? And how do we define what is art and what is not art? And what we'll find is really that there is no easy answer. For example, if you look at the image here on your screen, some of you may well think, oh, that's graffiti, that's defacement. And some of you may well think, wow, that's pretty cool. So there you go. Some call it art and some not. This particular piece is after or in the style of the artist Banksy and we're going to look at him a little bit more this semester. Some of you might be familiar with his work. He's sort of a rebel artist really. And now let's look at a few more quotes and ideas about the question what exactly is art? Now here's a Russian philosopher Leo, to Leo Tolstoy and he says a real work of art destroys in the consciousness of the receiver the separation between himself and the artist. I find this uh, a little bit more serious, a moving definition of what is art because really when, you, when one is struck to their core by seeing a work of art then that artist has been extremely successful. Now that might also be the case if a work of art causes you to get outraged or to take action of some kind, then that art has also been successful in some way because it has affected the viewer. It has gotten the viewer from the point of view of just simply looking to responding deeply. And now a little tongue-in-cheek humor by the artist Banksy. It says, the bad artists imitate, the great artists steal. Now here this is a quote by Pablo Picasso that has been scratched out and Banksy has put his name in there. So obviously he is um, joining the ranks of the great artists who steal in creating this work. And Then we have just something kind of interesting. I found these images on the internet and I thought it was really fascinating to look at the way that all that this question was posed to so many uh, in so many different vantage points. What is art for? Well that's actually a question that we're going to look at from a bunch of different perspectives during this lesson. At the beginning of our chapter there's a quote where it says that art has great value in society today. And I find myself when I read that I thought really? Because um, compared to times in the past art is actually sort of um, on the back burner in today's society. So that doesn't mean that the creative process isn't still alive and well, but in, sometimes artists have to be resourceful in today's society. We're going to talk a little bit more about how art is valued. Um, you know, back in the Renaissance, artists were sort of uh, like rock stars in society in Florence and in uh, Rome, where the Renaissance was centered. But Vincent van Gogh, he's an interesting case, and this is his Wheat Fields in Cyprus. It's a lot like Starry Night if you look at the way the sky is painted, but then again it's a unique piece and it's really a beautiful piece by Van Gogh. Um, you know, he painted this during his lifetime when very few of his paintings sold. There's a mythology that none of his paintings ever sold, but that, that's debatable. It doesn't really matter. But the fact is that uh, a few years back one of his paintings actually sold for $85 million. And that's very interesting because he was so prolific at the end of his life that he painted, you know, literally hundreds of paintings in the last few months of his life. So art and value is an interesting uh, way of considering it. And really, it doesn't have so much to do with the time spent or the, it's a kind of a mysterious thing, actually. So let's move on and talk about how images affect us. Here we have the Mona Lisa. Now the Mona Lisa is one of the most famous works in all of history, right? We talked about in a past module how because she's so recognizable you can't just see it as a painting. Here's a few more fun facts about the Mona Lisa. It was actually trimmed down. It was originally probably a much bigger painting but we will never know. Now the one on the left is by Marcel Duchamp and he's kind of poking fun at the Mona Lisa much as in your book there's the um, Warhol piece where he did the same thing. The, and basically what Mar Marcel Duchamp is doing is he's changing the image to make you actually stop and take notice. And I'm sure it's offensive to a lot of people but actually that was probably his intent. 
Now let's talk a little bit more about Andy Warhol. He was a really interesting character and he looked at image as being separate from the person. Here's his uh, rep repetitive images of John Lennon. These are done with a silk screen, but he also did very famous images of Marilyn Monroe, of a Coke can. One of the Marilyn Monroe pieces is actually at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville. But anyway, uh, Warhol just kind of was very interested in how image in our society was so much more important than the person themselves that he kind of made fun of that. There are many different aspects to look at as we consider what art is and what art isn't. And one of them is the audience for the art. Does it have to be looked at and appreciated by someone in order to be art? Obviously this one is a lot about the audience. I just found it to be an interesting photograph. Um, is it about looking at the art? Is it about recording that? And what does it mean uh, when your audience for your art really changes? One artist that they look at in the textbook that they bring up is the artist Monet. Now Monet was one of the primary uh, impressionists. These were artists that were working during the late 1800s and they really did serve to change the course of art history for all time. Now Monet in his early days was a radical. He lived very simply, he didn't have enough to eat, but he was completely dedicated to his art. And then as he became older, um, his art became widely appreciated, and he was considered a great master. So his audience, as he was older, was um, one that considered him to be one of the greatest artists in the world. Now let's look at the statue David. So this piece by the artist Verrocchio really represents another relationship of an artist with his audience. This piece was commissioned by the wealthy Medici family. And this family was really partly responsible for all of the art that was made in the Renaissance. Well, because they spent a lot of money on art, and it became very fashionable to pour money into the arts. And I think this is what I was referring to when I questioned that first line in the module this week that says that art has great value in our society today. If you look back at history, there's been other times when artists really did get a lot more uh, funding and support, and not necessarily by governments, but by patrons, by individuals, because they felt that art was a really important part of life. Now this particular piece, also this artist, now he came out of uh, what we could call the apprentice system. So as a young boy, probably nine or ten years old, he started working in an artist's workshop, and that was how he learned. Now later he became a teacher in his own workshop and he had a young student named Leonardo da Vinci. Now the story goes that this is actually a portrait of the young Leonardo da Vinci. Also later on when um, Verrocchio was working on a painting his young student, 15 years old, painted an angel and that one angel really showed some uh, radical changes in the way that the human form was depicted. And the legend is that when Verrocchio saw what his young student had done, he put down his paints and he never painted again. Now I don't really know if this is true, but it would be sad because obviously he's a really gifted artist in his own right. But let's move on and talk about something totally different. This is from the Persian miniature tradition. And we will look at some videos during the course of the semester of sort of a modern day Persian miniature painting. It's very intricate, it's very involved, and it's a little bit like what we had, what we called illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages, that they were made primarily in France and in England. But back to this piece. For this piece, the audience was the Sultan. Um, it was made in modern-day Iran by three artists who worked together on a 360-page book. The, there's Dasafanta, Shravana, and Madhava Kurd. But they were part of this workshop of uh, Vakbar. Now this piece, particular piece, was um, created in the 16th century. So in this case, they were well-funded and they were supported to create work really just to please the king, quite simply. So now let's look at a whole other example. 
this one I find so fascinating because it was a, a piece created by a man named James Hampton. And as you look at it now, it is in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. But where this piece came from, oh, it's called The Throne of the Third Heaven and the New Millennium. So this guy was a janitor working in federal office buildings, but at night he would go into a little garage and he would make this incredible piece. Now, actually, they found him dead in the garage working on the piece. Here's a little bit of detail. Now, it's made of actually aluminum foil, gold foil, cut cardboard, just really found objects. And if you look up in the corner here, that's where he was working. That's the garage. And no one knew. Nobody knew about this in his life. So for him, you could say his audience was, maybe for him his audience was God. Maybe he felt like he was doing a religious practice to work on this piece in solitude and in secrecy until he died. So now it's considered a great masterpiece. So as long as we're on this subject, let's go one more. And this is another one where we can really question the audience. This is an example of cave painting. And it's from, oh, you know, 25,000 BC. <clears throat> and in this piece, look at the exquisite artisan uh, ability, artistic ability of this artist. Now understand that this was painted way in a dark cave. And the artist could only use these little bitty lamps that had, um, they had animal fat as the oil and moss as the uh, wick. This was how these were painted. And then they remained closed in the caves for roughly 25,000 years, give or take a few thousand, until they were discovered in the early 20th century. Now when these pieces were discovered, and the story of the cave paintings is just extraordinary really, if you look at how they did it and we don't know why they did it. But anyway, when they were discovered, and we well-meaning humans started to visit them in the caves, immediately these works started to deteriorate because human beings bring in fungus, outside air, and all the rest. So again, these paintings are hidden away where there's photographs, there's copies of the caves, but people are very rarely allowed to view these anymore, and yet they're great masterpieces. So what's the point? Should you make it for the audience, or should the art be created for the experience itself? That's one of those proverbial questions that we ask again and again. So now let's talk for a moment about art and beauty. We th often we think that art is successful if it's beautiful, if it makes us feel good, much as a, a Thomas Kincaid painting can make us feel good. But this is actually a pretty recent development. Around uh, in the 18th century, there was something called the Enlightenment, which uh, people believed that they could live the ideals of the ancient Greeks, that they could live in sort of an idealized society. And they believed that art should be pleasing and support this ideal. They had something called disinterested contemplation, sort of an impersonal appreciation of art. So you just felt good, you didn't get too engaged, and, and art was then sort of nice. But I think, and many, most artists today think, that's a pretty limited point of view. Because what we really want is to engage with the art. That's a much more successful than simply feeling good when we look at a piece of art. Now in the book they give you an example of Bellini's Pietà, but let's look instead at Michelangelo's Pietà which is one of the greatest sculptures of all time. Here we have Michelangelo holding, I mean, I'm sorry, here we have Mary holding the dead Christ. Now, is that beautiful? Well, yes, it is. Look at the folds of the robe. If you look closely, even where her fingers are holding Jesus' flesh, it looks like he's dead. It's a very powerful piece. And yet, it's not beautiful in the traditional sense, and yet it engages us, and it's a powerful work of art. Now, in the text also, there's an image by the artist Goya, and his is an interesting story. But now, as I look at the clock, I see that the interesting story is going to begin in part two of our audio on chapter, what is it, chapter two in the book, and we will continue from there. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned and tune in again.